Hi, I'm Jules van Binsberg and a finance professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm Jonathan Burke, a finance professor at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. And this is the All Else Equal podcast. Welcome back, everybody. Today, we're going to attack a subject which is somewhat controversial and I think worth talking about, which is lying to people for their own good. And it's not just lying to people for their own good. It's potentially also lying to people for the public's good. So that it's not in somebody else's own interest that you're lying to them, but that you somehow think that you make society better off by telling lies to certain groups of people. Now, I think that one of the good reasons for us to discuss this topic, Jonathan, is because it's clearly an all else equal mistake. What happens is people can get a short-term advantage by lying to people, and getting them to act in a way that's either for their own good or the public good, but they ignore the fact that once it comes out that it's a lie, people no longer trust. And once the credibility is gone, you can no longer lie to them again. And the worst part of that, of course, is the cost. You can't tell the truth either because people won't believe you. And it's, I think, loss of credibility associated with lying to people is a very costly mistake. For sure. And if you think about what institutions in society derive their authority from, I think in many cases, it's from their credibility. So losing this credibility is, in fact, costly to society as a whole in the long run. Now, let's talk about these two types that we introduced earlier. So let's start with the first type, which is let's think of an example where we lie to people or the government lies to people for their own good. The obvious example is marijuana or drugs in general. People have tended to exaggerate how bad marijuana is for you in the hopes of stopping people from trying marijuana. I would say they do this because I'm not sure it's true, but they think that it's true that somehow marijuana is a gateway drug. So that they would probably admit to you that marijuana is no worse for you than alcohol. Maybe it's even better than alcohol. But that when people take marijuana, that then leads to them being more likely to take drugs that everybody agrees on is really bad for you, like heroin. Indeed. But the irony, of course, of the situation is, is that If you overstate how bad marijuana is, and then people would find out that marijuana isn't actually so bad, will they believe you when you're trying to make the point that the next bad drug is really bad? And therefore, in the end, the ironic conclusion of the story is that you've turned marijuana into a gateway drug, even though it wasn't before, just because you were lying. That's the ultimate irony. So if you follow the strategy and you say marijuana is a terrible drug and people try it anyway and they find that it isn't terrible, then they no longer believe you that heroin is a bad drug. And so marijuana indulgently becomes a gateway drug and a perfect example of an all else equal mistake. Indeed. So now let's go to the second case, which is lying to people for the public good. So one example, I think, and it's an example that has come up in one of our previous episodes, is what is called the tragedy of the commons. And I think that the example that we used for this was that there's a bunch of people that are fishing on a lake. And if everybody fishes on the lake, then you remove all the fish from the lake. The lake can no longer self-generate enough fish. And so if everybody overfishes, we end up with nothing. So now, can we somehow, by lying to people, get away from this bad equilibrium? Yes. So let's imagine that we have a switch, and the switch works like this. If you lie to people, nobody will ever find out. Ask the question, would everybody, and when I say nobody, it means everybody, including yourself, you would never find out, would they be in favor of flipping the switch. And the irony is that on the lake they would, right? Because if I know for sure that everybody else will not fish the lake, I, of course, then have an incentive to fish because I'm single-handedly not going to overfish the lake, but everybody's in that same position. But what if I could tie my own hands? What if I was lied to and I believed for certain too? Well, then I'd be in favor of it because there would be more fish in the lake for everybody and we're all better off. So if that switch existed... We would all vote to switch it on. Indeed. But of course, the problem is that we can never ensure that this works for everybody. The switch doesn't really exist. No. So if there's any chance 
that somebody finds out that it's a lie, they will go and fish because they'll know what oh, there's fish in the pond. And I'm not going to my, my marginal effect is small. And then everybody else will notice that they're eating fish. And everybody will then realize the government was lying. And then they won't believe the government when the government was telling the truth anymore. And so in many ways, I think that the credibility of the government should be viewed as a public good in and of itself, which means that you need to use that credibility sparingly and you don't want to waste it, particularly, and that is really the theme I think of this episode, is there are situations where there is this appealing short-term benefit that people then sacrifice because the long-term cost is the loss of credibility. And I think one of the themes that we really want to stress here today is that you need to very carefully think about that long-term credibility problem because if you ignore that effect, you're going to fall for the short-term optimization every time and you're going to every time pick the lie, not realizing that you're gradually undermining the long-term credibility and end up with nothing. Jules, I think we should talk about some of the stuff we spoke about in preparation of this episode. Because in preparation of this episode, Jules and I were discussing whether we should ever lie for the public good. I have a strong opinion that it's a bad idea for the credibility argument. And then Jules immediately pointed out to me that we often tell white lies. We're both in relationships. And when you're in a relationship, sometimes you tell white lies. And I said, yes, but that in general, I try not to tell white lies because in the end, the person understands that I'm telling white lies and then they don't know when to believe in, when not to believe in. I put a lot of emphasis on being credible. But I think Jules disagreed with me. Well, not necessarily. I actually think that in many ways, you end up at the same equilibrium anyway, because If you tell enough white lies to your spouse and they know you well enough, it isn't actually a white lie anymore at that point because they know you so well that they know exactly when you're telling the white lie and therefore there's no difference in the information that is communicated in the end. But it does illustrate exactly the point that you were trying to make, which is in the long run, because of credibility, even white lies don't work. So now if you have a short-term interaction with a stranger And just for social cohesion and to avoid conflict, you tell a white lie once. There are no reputational consequences to this, and therefore there's no credibility at stake. But I do indeed agree with you that in long-term relationships between people, white lies are really a ruse. So now the issue of today's episode is thinking about the place in society where the government lies most to its citizens. It's in the area of medicine. In the area of medicine, not only does the government routinely lie, but doctors, I would say, even taught to routinely lie to their patients, to exaggerate whenever there's a case where there was something of bad health. Doctors routinely exaggerate the consequences of the action that leads to bad health. And often in cases where there was something healthy for you, they'll over-exaggerate the benefits in the hopes of getting you to do the good behavior. Indeed, I agree. Although I'm not sure that for the government, it's the area where they lie the most. Certainly, I think there is lying for people's own good. But you can think of wartime situations or something like that, where it may be even more pressing for the government to have propaganda and different information provision. But yes, medicine is definitely an area where both doctors and the government do tell people things that may not always be fully true. And I do think that, unfortunately, the latest episode that we've had with this, which was the COVID pandemic, I think there was quite a bit of that going on. And so for that reason, I think the guest that we decided to have today is a colleague of yours at Stanford, Jonathan. Yeah, we had to talk to Jay Bhattacharya, but Lord Jules, let me just hold back on the introduction and say, where you corrected me when I said that medicine is a case where the government lies the most. I think you're right. I misspoke there. We know politicians lie to the constituents routinely. I do think, though, medicine is a place where the constituents believe that there's a role for the government lie. I think most people would not be happy with their politicians lying to them. Maybe some will because they want to feel good about their politicians, but most of us think that politicians should be telling us the truth. Whereas I don't think most of us believe that it's necessarily the case that doctors should be telling us the truth. I think there are a lot of people who, when they would rather not hear the bad diagnosis just because they feel that it, that, that, that would be a really bad thing. And so that's, in medicine, it's, I think, a more, a more interesting question. More subtle. Yeah. And so that's why I think I want to talk about this today. And let's explain exactly why we've invited Jay to the show. So Jay Bhattacharya is a world 
name is immunologist, and he's been a professor at Stanford for 40 years. One of his areas of contribution is what I would call getting it right. What do I mean by this? When you have a disease, it's very easy to measure, for example, how many people are dying from the disease. It's often very difficult to measure how many people have the disease. And what often happens is people measure that by just looking into how many people come into hospital, ignoring the fact there are many, many people who get the disease who recover by themselves and don't even come to hospital or don't even go to the doctor. And so to figure out mortality rates, you need to figure out how many people have the disease. You need a good denominator. And Jay has made his career trying to figure out what the denominator is. And in particular, during COVID, he worked very hard on trying to figure out what the denominator is. And many people have thought that what he was doing was detrimental to the public good. Yes, because of course, what he found was that the denominator was much bigger than what people thought before, which also implied that the fatality rate of COVID was actually much lower than what people thought before. And I think that some people were worried that if that information would get out, people would not take the disease as seriously as they otherwise would have with potentially detrimental health consequences. Actually, Jules was even worse than that. They didn't even want him to conduct the study because they were worried that the end would go up and that would cause people to change behavior. So it's not just that, in fact, you're right, he found out the mortality rate was much lower than people said. But even if he hadn't, they didn't even want him to do the study. And that's an interesting question for the public good. So with that in mind, why don't we introduce Jay? Our guest today is Jay Bhattacharya, who is Professor of Medicine at Stanford University's Medical School. He's also an economist. He has a PhD in economics. He is a fellow of the Hoover Institution, and he's also an associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, which means Jay is both a research doctor and an economist. And the one thing that we did not have a very high supply of at the time of COVID. Jay, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jonathan. Nice to be here. It's great to have you, Jay. So, Jay, before we get started, I think our uh, listeners might be interested in at least a shortened version of the story of how, in the early part of the pandemic, you attempted to calculate the number of people who had COVID and got into trouble because you did that. And it'd be nice if you could just give us a brief synopsis of what happened. If you look at respiratory viruses like this in the past, for instance, during the uh, swine flu pandemic in 2009, very early on, people will give these death rate estimates that are very high, 3 4%. That's what happened with the swine flu epidemic. And what later happened is a whole bunch of researchers did studies of antibodies in the population, seroprevalence studies. The idea is to estimate how widespread the disease was, because then once you understand that, you can get a better denominator, right? So like the early estimates are always focused on people that are severely ill. And the denominator only includes people who are severely ill. If you take people who are severely ill, a very high rate of them die, three, four percent. Well, when this pandemic hit, I had the same exact thought. I'm like, okay, three, four percent, that's what the World Health Organization is saying. That can't be right. It's a very highly infectious virus. It must be many more people are infected and recovered that we just don't know about. So I conducted a study in Santa Clara County, where Stanford is, and L.A. County, and actually a one nationwide with, with Major League Baseball, to estimate how widespread the virus was. And what we found in L.A. County and Santa Clara County was that there were 40 in the community at large, not institutional, not in nursing homes, because we, we didn't have permission to go there. But in the community at large, there were 40 to 50 times more infections than cases. 40 for every person that was known to the public health to have the virus. 40 or 50 people walking around with antibodies that indicated they'd had the virus and recovered. So that meant the death rate was not 3 4%. It turned out, after you account for like the lagging time between infection and death, something like 0.2% with a very steep age gradient. It was older people that had the highest risk. We released this study and the world just blew up. I started getting death threats. There were all these academics that thought I didn't know how to divide, even though I published a lot of papers in my life. And we released this as a preprint. There was actually a lot of constructive criticism too. And so we released an update a week later, same results, just better statistical methods. But the damage was done. In fact, a lot of my Stanford colleagues, they were skeptical about the test kit we're using. Just briefly, there was a press attack by BuzzFeed against me and John Ianides, who was also a co-author of the study, arguing that we had somehow taken $5,000 from JetBlue for the study. The money actually went to Stanford University, not to me or to John, 
Stanford knew this and nevertheless started something what they called a fact-finding mission on the basis of the BuzzFeed report. It was really, really stressful. It made it very difficult. And, and there was this like cloud over the study created by the Stanford actions. And I think if people had actually understood what the study implied, which is that the disease was already very widespread in early April 2020, and 3 4% is a big number relative to so early in the pandemic, that meant the lockdowns are not going to work. The disease is going to spread basically to the entire population eventually at some point. And that the death rate was very age dependent. Older people, high risk, younger people, low risk. The obvious implication is focused protection of vulnerable people. Instead, what we had was this continued emphasis by public health that everyone's equally at risk. We all need to comply with the lockdowns. We all need to have a sort of suffer together when in fact it was really vulnerable older people that was highest risk. And so the right thing to do was to protect them and not disrupt the lives of, for instance, children. So Jay, we've spoken about this privately, and I know you agree with me that part of the reason people didn't want you either to do the study or to publicize your study was this concept of lying for the public good. They felt that once you showed the death rate was much lower, people would take it less seriously and they wouldn't obey the government requirements. And because of that, they didn't want you to release your study. What do you think? Do you think that is the reason? I think that is entirely the reason, Jonathan. And I'll give you a couple of pieces of evidence for this. So one is, if you look at what the public health messaging was at the time, there's a telling thing that happened with a very small thing, but it's quite telling. There was an NBA player named Rudy Gobert who got COVID early in the pandemic. And he gave a press conference as a young, fit NBA player, a basketball player. He gave a press conference where he like licked his finger, licked the microphone, made fun of this, made light of this. Of course, he recovered just fine because he's young and healthy. And the public health authorities just attacked the poor guy. He forced a groveling apology. Oh, we all have to take it equally seriously. Jonathan, they wanted compliance with the lockdown orders. They were scared to death that young people would say, well, I'm not really at risk. I'm going to go do my young person thing. I'm going to go to school, for instance. That was a deadly threat to the authority of public health. The second piece of evidence, I went on NPR to describe the study. And the reporter at NPR, the one thing she wanted to talk about is, well, your study is fine and nice, but isn't this going to make people want to hold COVID parties? Go try to get COVID because you're finding a death rate of uh, you know very low risk for young people. It's one of these things where like, you know, I no, I don't want people to go intentionally go get COVID. But at the same time, I don't want them to like disrupt their life opportunities for a low risk thing when there are alternate policies to protect the people who are at high risk. Ironically, Jonathan, what ended up happening is we didn't take the virus seriously enough. We didn't do enough to protect older people because we thought that by limiting the spread of the virus, we'd automatically protect older people. And so we didn't adopt the policies that would have actually protected older people. I mean, that, I guess, is the ultimate irony. The results you had, just remember, this was March when nobody knew what was going on. You had enough information at that point to construct public policy that would have greatly limited the economic damage and saved old people's lives, and nobody was listening because they were so certain that people couldn't make decisions for themselves, that they had to keep lying to people. So, Jay, two questions. First, it seems to me that as the data is further developed and more and more studies have come in, I think your original study has largely proven to be correct, right? You were right about it as one of the first people that estimated these numbers. Is that a fair summary? It's entirely a fair summary. There's been now 100 or more seroprevalence studies conducted in 2020 itself. And the comprehensive meta-analyses by John E. Needies have found that our estimate was mortality risk was right there in the median among those studies. That is amazing. And the age gradient, of course, also has been found. Now, in places that had more older people, you had a higher infection fatality rate, New York City, for instance. But in places that had younger people, in Mumbai, for instance, the infection fatality rate was lower. So you just, you have the exact result you expected. This is a highly infectious disease. It spreads pretty easily. And it's very, very difficult to stop the spread of it. What might be possible is, is protecting older people. That was never considered, not deeply enough in March of 2020, April of 2020. Now, do you think you can put yourself in the place of the decision makers? And can you think of scenarios where intentionally exaggerating a fatality rate like this would make sense? Or do you think that generally speaking, this is something that policymakers in medical research should abstain from? So is it this specific circumstances in which they were just wrong about doing it this way? Or do you think there's a more general issue with this? 
I don't like the idea of public health lying to the public. I think ultimately what it does is it undermines confidence in public health. It might work for a short time. It might even work for a year or two. But ultimately, what ends up happening is a backlash that you cannot recover from. And I think much of the effectiveness of public health relies on public trust. You vaccinate your young kids with a host of vaccines that are absolutely necessary for public health. If you undermine public trust generally in public health, then what you get is a backlash that results in more kids being exposed to diseases that they don't need to be exposed to. There's political support for public health for basic programs in poor countries, in sanitation, public support for sanitation programs, a whole host of other things that require the public to trust public health and support public health. It's very short-sighted because you get what? I mean, you get more compliance with an order that you're not even sure is going to be necessary to protect the public. It's just a big mistake. The example I would use is Swedish public health. They have tremendous support from the public in part because they don't treat the public like children. They say, here's what we know, here's what we don't know. We'd request that you don't gather more than 50 people when the disease is spreading. And people don't gather. That's not a mandate. They just don't do it because it's not wise. And they trust public health not to do it when they say that. Credibility is a scarce resource in public health, in a tremendously valuable one, and we threw it away. Credibility is a scarce resource everywhere. It's a scarce resource in business. It's a scarce resource in government. And unfortunately, public policymakers will focus on their particular issue and ignore the wider impact of that. It's a classic or else equal mistake. I'm going to solve my problem and don't worry about anybody else. And it's hugely costly for society. We have all these people walking around with all their conspiracy theories. It's because we've lost trust in government because they lied to us. That's such a good way to put this, Jonathan. I mean, if you think about what actually happened, why did the lockdowns fail? It's because our societies are unequal. One way to think of it, get at this is why did the lockdowns not happen in 2009 during the swine flu pandemic? Well, it's because there wasn't a way to replace 20% of the population's work with Zoom. Zoom caused the lockdown, enabled the lockdown. Whereas poorer people, they couldn't comply because they're just, they have to feed their families. So Jay, what is so surprising to me about this is from politicians, I think, the idea that they have a short horizon because they need to get reelected. And if they don't get reelected, everything stops for them. I think the short sightedness is almost built in, for, at least for some of them. But wouldn't you think that for public health officials, they have a longer horizon that they should care about? So why did this short sightedness have such an effect for them is somewhat of a puzzle to me. It's interesting because like, it's hard to convey this to economists because we're such a cantankerous bunch and we, we like to fight with each other over like, this is one plus one, two. Yeah, sometimes. But the problem in public health is very hierarchical, it turns out. Not that many people look at the evidence and decide, here's the policy, right? This policy essentially was decided by NIH, by officials of the NIH. Just a few people decided the right strategy was lockdown. And they were immune to evidence. And they almost seemed scared themselves, like they were going to get blamed if something went wrong. They viewed lockdown as like a precautionary principle kind of thing. Yeah, there's uncertainty. Yes, there's uncertainty. Of course, we should just do this. You look at Dr. Fauci appearing in front of Congress, Rand Paul in in, in the early days, and Paul's asking him about some of these collateral harms. It's like he doesn't even understand that these collateral harms to poor people might exist. It just never crossed his mind. The only risk he cared about was COVID. So here's another thing, and which I heard you say in a different podcast, and, and I wondered whether you could comment on it. As economists, we believe in this dynamic rational planning, but it seems to me that in this case, there was actually a dynamically rational plan. We had a playbook of what we were going to do if a respiratory virus like this would break out. That playbook said that we were not going to do lockdowns, and as soon as it happened, we did them anyway. Is that right? It's exactly what happened. So for instance, you can see Anders Tegnell, the the Swedish public health leader, saying, look, we're not doing an experiment in Sweden. Everyone else is doing the experiment. This is the standard way we handle respiratory virus pandemics. I've come to learn that there was a parallel effort rooted in biosecurity that goes back to actually like the anthrax in 2001, where there were like plans to do local lockdowns in case of biological attacks. In, there was a debate that happened in, the, in some elements of the public health community to say, well, look, maybe we can use this for civilian purposes too. In 2006, there was a very interesting paper by Don Henderson, who was the you know, probably the most important epidemiologist of the 20th century who helped conquer smallpox. And he wrote a paper saying you shouldn't do lockdowns because for exactly the reasons we've been talking about, the disruption would be too great and that you'd end up doing more harm than good. But there were public health people holding war games over and over again 
in the 2000s where they were pretending and saying, well, what would happen if we would do lockdowns? Well, well, people would resist. Well, then we'd need to have control over the information flow. So we need to like censor dissidents or something. They had a playbook, an alternate playbook that they had never tried before. And for whatever reason, they decided this was the time to put it in place instead of the standard pandemic policy of focused protection of vulnerable people and disrupting society as little as possible, given the fact that people will be scared. Jay, let's talk about vaccinations. You can clear something up that I've never understood. When the initial studies were done and 95% of the people were protected, I said at the time, okay, what about the other 5%? Is it cross-sexual variation in the virus or is it cross-sexual variation in human beings? If it's cross-sexual variation in human beings, we're fine. If it's cross-sexual variations in the virus, this vaccine isn't going to stop the virus. Okay. And it obviously turned out to be cross-sexual variation in the virus. Now, what I don't understand is if the reason the vaccine doesn't work to stop the spread of the virus, it obviously works in terms of lowering symptoms and preventing deaths, but it doesn't work in terms of prevention and the spread of the virus. Why is it that the public health officials want to vaccinate everybody? It seems to me if I was the only person vaccinated, then I wouldn't want anybody else to get vaccinated because then there wouldn't be the bias, the selection bias against the virus that I was vaccinated against. It seems as if if it's about cross-sexual variation in the virus, you don't want everybody vaccinated from the point of view of spread of the virus. You do from the point of view of the severity of symptoms, but from the point of view of the spread of the virus, you don't. And so then from a public health perspective, you can just tell people, look, guys, if you want to get the virus really bad, don't get vaccinated. It's up to you. You There's no externality there. Am I missing something? No, you're not missing. I mean, there is no externality, although I I cast it just a little bit differently, but the conclusion is exactly right. The trial itself looked at the prevention of symptomatic infection for two months, symptomatic infection. It did not look at prevention of all infections. In the Santa Clara study, we found 40% of people who'd had antibodies couldn't recall any symptoms in the last three, four months. Like they, the virus had produced an infection that didn't produce any symptoms in 40% of the people. They could have checked for this. For instance, during the vaccine trial, they could have looked to see if spouses of the person who was vaccinated or, or got placebo, they got sick. And they could have then tested for very easily within the context of the trial for prevention of transmission. But they didn't do that. The trials also didn't check for prevention of severe disease. So when I looked at the trials in December of 2020, I thought, okay, well, if it prevents symptomatic infection 95% for two months, that's good. But we don't know that it prevents transmission or infection because they didn't check for it. It's only two months. So I came to the same conclusion as you, Jonathan. There's no certainty of any externality. And so that means any mandate is, is useless. At best, what we do is we use the virus to protect people against severe disease. Because if you prevent symptomatic infection, you probably also prevent severe disease. And so then what do you do? You use the vaccine for focused protection of vulnerable people. Prioritize old people, prioritize people who are immunocompromised to get the vaccine. And for the rest of the population, make it optional. Do not force them. Instead, what public health officials did is they were, based on nothing, hope, they thought, well, this probably works to prevent all infection or most infection. And if we get 80%, you heard Fauci talk about this at the time, 80% of the population vaccinated, you'll have herd immunity, and then the disease will go away. The World Health Organization changed its definition of herd immunity in the winter of 2020 to exclude immunity based on natural infection. They only included vaccination as a source of immunity in the herd immunity calculations. They had this very simple model, vaccinate 80% of the population and the disease will stop spreading because it's below the herd immunity threshold. Now, given everything that we know today and given everything that we've learned and all the mistakes that we've made, do you think that this is going to make a meaningful difference the next time something like this happens? Or do you think we will again forget everything we've just learned? We may make good plans now and have nice publications in which we have a consensus, but as soon as the panic breaks out, we're again going to make all these mistakes that we just made. Or do you think there's the benefit that we've learned something? (laughs) (laughs) I think that we stand in a balance right now, and it's not clear to me which direction it'll go. One direction is the people that made these mistakes want to just sweep it under the rug, pretend like it never happened, give themselves awards, and then move on. That's exactly, I mean, a lot of the, there have been pandemic commissions to try to assess the damage from the pandemic, and they've just been whitewashes. Like the U.S. Congress, the House-led Democrats ran a pandemic commission where they concluded somehow that it was like, you know, Scott Atlas that was responsible for all of the deaths or something. On the other hand, 
you could treat this like we treated the Challenger disaster in 1986 when you know the space shuttle blew up. You do honest, scientifically minded autopsy of the pandemic response and then undertake reforms of the agencies so that these kinds of problems don't happen again. That could happen. So I wrote this thing with eight colleagues of mine called the Norfolk Group document, where we basically outline 80 pages of questions that a honest COVID commission would ask. We have to have something like that. I and mean, if people don't like my 80 pages of questions, they can add more. <laughs> we just need an honest response and it should be bipartisan and scientifically minded. But it also should be clear when mistakes were made that these mistakes were made. We can't afford to let this thing happen again. In one of the previous episodes, we had the concept of a blameless post-mortem. So it seems that's what we need here so that we at least can move forward. I agree with that. The other analogy I use is when a patient dies in a medical care setting, there'll be often a conference called an M&M conference, morbidity and mortality conference. The doctors and other caregivers who are responsible will get together in a room and, and sometimes it's quite brutal, but the outcome isn't to blame anybody. The outcome is to figure out what went wrong so they don't do it again. Yes. You need something exactly like that. Well, Jay, thank you so much for being on the show. I learned a tremendous amount. Me too. It was great, Jay. It was wonderful to talk to both of you, and it's fun to talk with economists for a change. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to the All Else Equal podcast. Please leave us a review at Apple Podcast. We'd love to hear from our listeners. And be sure to catch our next episode by subscribing or following our show wherever you listen to your podcast. For more information and episodes, visit allelseequalpodcast.com or follow us on LinkedIn. The All Else Equal podcast is a production of Stanford University's Graduate School of Business and is produced by University FM.